All right, Mark chapter number 10. Hopefully it's helping you to understand a couple of things. Not only that your heart that we talk about is not located in your under your breastbone in the center of your chest, the thing that's about the size of your fist and has the four chambers in it and surrounded by the pericardium, all that kind of stuff. We're not talking about the muscle that's there. We're talking about the place where your conscience resides. We're talking about the place where your emotions are. We're talking about the place where you do your thinking. So he says to you, uh, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That's an important, out of the abundance of the heart, what? The mouth. So you have to realize that sometimes under pressure, you'll hear some things come out and you're thinking, man, where'd that come from? Well, it's been residing in the heart for a long time under pressure, I, not to be gross or anything. I've already kind of gotten in trouble about one of the illustrations I used last week, but not to be gross, but it's kind of like uh, uh, having a pimple and under pressure. <laughs> yeah, I did. I went there anyway, didn't I? Uh, un under pressure, it what? It pops, right? It comes out, you know, mayonnaise, mustard, ketchup right there on the... <laughs> So, so here's the thing. If that stuff's residing there, it's important for you to be able to get those things out. You say, why? Because under pressure, that stuff will pop to the surface. And generally speaking, when it does, it's usually not good. I wish I would be able to have the kind of heart that I knew that under pressure, there would be nothing but love, joy, peace, and long suffering and mercy and all that other stuff. I'm working on trying to get that portion of my heart clean enough so that under pressure, I don't say and do something that I wish I hadn't. And I told a fellow I was sitting there uh, yesterday on the way to the airport or whenever it was, uh, sometime anyway, I guess the night before. But at any rate, we're on the way to the airport and, and we're talking about it. And he brought up something along those lines. And I said, well, have you ever had this thing and you kind of almost feel it coming up? Like, let's say you're having an argument with somebody like maybe your wife. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's coming out and something's telling you, you better stop. You better stop. You better stop. <laughs> And the next thing you know, it goes out and you're like, oh, could I get that back? And I said, but the better thing to do is, is to prevent it from being there in the first place. Not to try to suppress it, not to try to push it down. Not, if that's how you're really feeling, then maybe we need to change the way you feel. This, is the, this has to do with that root of bitterness that gets in there. You say, what happens? That bitterness stays there. And then guess what happens? What comes out under pressure is that bitterness. And it can manifest itself in a multitude of other things. You might be bitter. Let's say, let's just use me as the scapegoat here this morning. Let's say you're bitter at me, but because you haven't said anything to me about it or whatever, you're having a conversation with a friend of yours. And then they say something that kind of trips your trigger. And then the next thing you know, your bitterness toward me comes out on them. You say, why? Bitterness is indiscriminate. I don't know if you notice that or not. It's not individualistic. It's indiscriminate. You get bitter about it. Then you know what happened? You'll hear something. And the way you hear it will be twisted by the bitterness. You say, why? You hear with your heart. Right? Don't tell me feelings don't matter. Don't tell me emotions don't matter. You can be diswrought and you hear things, but you hear them through being diswrought at the time you hear it. And if that's the case, somebody that's trying to remember, I told you about the elderly lady that uh, went in and was screaming and cussing at the hospital years ago. And I went in there and man, I'm going to tell you what, you wouldn't believe the stuff coming out of her out of her mouth there. But the problem was, is she was under pressure and she was dehydrated. There was a physical thing, but she was attacking everybody in there. You know what the doctor said when I came in there? He said, she thinks we're trying to help her, but she thinks we're trying to hurt her. He said, we're trying to put a needle in her, but they think she thinks we're trying to kill her with a needle. She needed some, you know, some fluids and things like that. And he said, we're trying to calm her down and we're trying to help her. But everybody that comes around her, she sees them as an enemy. Well, you know, that's a true thing that happens oftentimes with Christians. You get mad at one or two people. Now, be honest. You get mad. At, oh, let's let's just forget Christians for a minute, okay? Just forget them for a second. Policeman, okay? You had one or two run-ins with a policeman, and maybe the guy was a jerk. Maybe he had a bad day. Maybe he wasn't kind and warm and fuzzy and, you know, like they're all trained and supposed to be, non-human and robotic. And, you know, and I, I'm really so sorry that I have to write you this ticket, and please forgive me, and I hope you don't hold it, any animosity against me. I, I, I'm, I'm really sorry that you, you had to kill somebody to learn the lesson that red means stop, and, but, but, but please don't take this personal. And I've scribbled my name on here, so you just don't remember me anymore and all that. They won't remember you, but they'll remember how you acted. And then you know what happens? All policemen are jerks. 
right? Well, all policemen are jerks. All preachers aren't jerks. But you know what you'll remember? The one that did something you put your faith and trust in and then they ran off with some money or they ran off with the secretary or, or something like that. You know what you remember? All preachers, they're just whoremongers and they, they're thieves, every one of them. Right? Well, you know you can do the same thing with Christians. Look, everybody in the congregation don't, don't hate you. Everybody, don't hate, everybody doesn't hate you. Right? But you know what you start looking at? Church people. You know how church people are? Well, wait a minute, man. I mean, there's a few jerks. I understand that. You know, there's nothing. You can't have a body without a hemorrhoid. You've got to have it every now and then. Right? It makes you appreciate it when you don't have one. But the, but the bottom line is, is everybody's not that way. And chances are probably you're that way sometimes too. But see, it can shape how you see things. So the importance of a clear conscience more so or le lesser than a clear heart, a clean heart. Why? Because it interprets how you hear things, it interprets how you see things, and it interprets how you say things. All right, now notice, if you will, please, we're in Mark chapter number 10. Get into a few verses here. And we've been talking about hardening that heart. There's nothing more dangerous. It's more dangerous than smoking or drinking. It's more dangerous than cussing or running around or doing whatever your list of things is to, that you shouldn't be doing. Uh, notice what he says. Mark chapter number 10, look in verse number 5. Jesus uh, answered unto them, For the hardness of your heart... He wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female for this cause from men leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and the twain shall be one and so on and so forth. You say, what happened? The Pharisees came in there and said, Moses said so on and so forth. And the Lord said, I had to write that because you got a hard heart. You say, what's the answer to a hard heart? The book. You say, why? The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the intellect, of the heart. So what's the cure for a hard heart? Here we are in the South. Why should I read my Bible? Because it's heart medicine. Now, I, I'm not a, a, a medical doctor in any way, shape, or form and all that, but I'm enough aware that when certain people have proclivities, AFibs and things like that, heart getting out of rhythm and that kind of deal, they'll give you a heart medicine to try to control those things, right? right. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you take the medicine or you just go, I got no heart trouble? Or do you take the doctor's word for it that I have a heart problem? And maybe he says to you, now listen, this may not happen again for another two years. But if it happens again, you could die. Right. Now I've got some medicine that you can take. And it'll reduce the chances of that happening to you by almost 100%. You won't happen to have it. But you've got to take this medicine to offset what's creating the problem. You going to take the medicine? Sometimes people that are real prone to heart attacks, they give them back in the day. I don't know if they still do it or not. It's a little brown bottle, little round thing. It has a little tiny pill to look about the size of saccharin, about the size of a BB. It's actually nitroglycerin. That's the stuff that has a huge amount of stuff that they soak gunpowder in and make uh, dynamite out of and put it under pressure. That's the catalyst that caused it to do that. It creates a little tiny explosion inside of you when you take that and can put your heart back in rhythm or can prevent a heart attack or help to diminish the effects of a heart attack. And they give them those and they don't go anywhere without that little bottle of nitroglycerin. And they feel that elephant or that horse standing on their chest and all of a sudden they're left arm starts bothering them and their jaw starts locking up and stuff like that. And then before long, they're kind of getting where they can't see. <laughs> and you say, well, I don't know, man. I don't feel like I really, I think I'll just see if I can live through it. Well, if you have any sense at all, you know what you're going to do? You're going to take that little black top off that brown bottle and you're going to pour one of them out and put it under your tongue so it gets assimilated quickly you through and get into your blood faster that way. And so you put it under your tongue and that thing kicks you and then you go to the doctor and the doctor says, if you hadn't have taken that little old tiny BB, that little tiny pill right there, you'd have probably died before you got here. Now, why are you telling me that, preacher? 
I'm telling you that, ladies and gentlemen, because reading your Bible and listening to the right kind of things does things for you, but not always in the physical realm. Amen. The book is a spiritual book. Didn't they just say thoughts and intents of the heart? Right. Not your body. You can read all day long. It won't cure you of cancer. Amen. You can read till the cows come home. It won't cure you of the flu or COVID or whatever else the new thing is out, monkey pox or whatever. It's not going to cure you of that. That thing is intended to work on the soul of a person, intended to work on how a person reacts to things by fixing your mind, your heart. And the Lord said, because you can harden off your heart. Now, I'm going to show you some things more about the hardness of the heart. Well, preacher, I thought we were done with that last week. Well, you have to read your Bible. Some of you probably went home and started looking some things up, looking 1 John 3, and you never realized there's so much in the Bible uh, about your power to be able to overcome God speaking to you. The, the, the change in your heart is the thing that will help you to learn or to change some things when it comes to how you deal with uh, people and human beings. All right, 1 John chapter number 3. Look, if you will, please, in verse number 17. Now, you remember the passage over there in the book of James? Uh, and in the book of James, it'll be... Um, it'll be uh, James 2. And in James chapter number 2, whosoever sees a brother that has a knees and says, uh, go and be warmed and go in peace and so on and so forth. You say, why would somebody do that? Well, the Lord's going to answer it for you here. The reason you would do that if you see a brother that has a need and you don't help him. I'm not talking about a guy standing over here who's got a roll of money big enough to choke a horse and got an SUV and a four bedroom house and all that because you pull by and will work for food. That's not what I'm talking about. He said, if you see a brother have a need and he has the humility to come to you and say, man, I'm, I'm jammed up. I mean, I, I got a problem. Can you help me out? Now the Lord's going to give you an answer as to if you just say, yeah, man, I'll pray for you. <laughs> and the guy's like, I appreciate you praying for me, but uh, I, I need a tank of gasoline, which nowadays you got to go take out a loan to get it, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, I, I could, uh, could use a meal. My kids could use some diapers. Well, you know, we'll be praying for you, you know, go, I, hope, I hope you get warmness of heart. See you in church on Sunday. <laughs> Do you realize people have physical needs sometimes? I mean, people get jammed up. You say, well, I'm not jammed up. Well, just give it time. You'll get you. You'll find yourself there. <laughs> Three o'clock in the morning, you call and say, hey, man, I've I'm, I'm, uh, got a flat tire and I don't know how to change the tire or my tire. My, my. Okay, well, good. You know, I can call a wrecker for you. <laughs> yeah, appreciate it. Uh, thank, thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out. I'll, I'll call somebody that can come pick me up and I'll take care of it tomorrow. But I was just hoping you, yeah, you know, I, it's cold outside, man. I can't. You see the illustration, right? All right. Now let me see if I can show you what's at the root of that thing. Look in John chapter three, look down in verse number 17, make it 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now that doesn't mean just die for them. That means putting aside what you want to do for the benefit of somebody else. That's good marital counseling. You say, why? Boys, you ain't going to always be able to do what you want to do. Sometimes you got to go walk around a shopping mall. You say, well, I just, no, no. Sometimes you got to go walk around a shopping mall. You say, why? Because she wants to. There's a barf bag in that right in front of you there. Well, I just think, no, no, you got to learn to do that. Sometimes you have to get, a, you know, more than a pair of, of shorts and flip-flops on and take her to some place other than McDonald's. Yeah. You did when you dated her. What happened? But preacher, you know, we can't afford that stuff now. You can afford that new rifle, can't you? Afford the extra channels on your sports TV, can't you? And for your little boy cave, can't you? Where's the woman cave? I said that one time in a message. He said, what do you mean the woman cave? She's got the whole house. I only got one room. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. Well, I guess there's that, you know. <laughs> But you, it's funny what you can afford, isn't it? Sometimes laying your life down. In greater love have no man than this, that a man lay down his life for what? His friend. That's more than just your physical life. 
Sometimes you have to be inconvenienced. We're talking about why would you tell somebody, yeah, pray for you, man, got you covered. Really? You know what Christian life is? Sometimes you have to take a phone call when you're busy. Sometimes you have to take a phone call and you, maybe your, your, your timing is off or whatever it might be. You say, why? You got to put your life down for the benefit of somebody else. That's real Christianity, folks. It's being inconvenienced for other people. There's no better way to show somebody you love them than to be inconvenienced. I know how it is with men. I know how it is with men, you know. Honey, I need you to fix so-and-so. I'll get it. I'll take care of it. And that means to the woman, don't ask me to fix it again for three months. But in three months, you're going to come back and say, remember that thing I told you about three months ago? You know what you have to do? You have to learn to do. It only took me about 40 years to learn it. I need to stop what I'm doing and go do it. You say, why? Because I'll send her the impression that what she needs done is not important to me. But boy, when I say I need some clothes, I'm fixing to go out of town. And you know what, what I'm saying indirectly is, is I, I, you know, I get up this morning, come down from my office and stuff like that. And there's everything I wore for this past six days. It's all washed and hanging up. You say, well, what's the big deal and all that kind of stuff? Well, it may not mean nothing to you, but I appreciate clean clothes. And if you stand next to me, you appreciate them too. You say, what is that? She don't wait till I got stuff to do and I got vacation Bible school going on and my list is full. She got a half a dozen emails this morning of people said, I was going to, but I can't. And I can't do this and I can't do this and I can't do this. Her plate's full. She said, well, what does that mean to you? See, it don't mean nothing to you. What it means to me was she was inconvenient. You know, she's sitting there. There's six shirts hanging up there. That telling me she loves me six times. There's all my underclothing, all that other stuff. Not, not just, you know, thrown out there. Folded up, put on the bed. Right. Yes, all my socks. Amen. When she found time, I got no idea when she found time. That with all she's got going on, you've got to be kidding me. Amen. You say, what am I trying to tell you? I'm trying to help you with your heart. Amen. I'm trying to tell you that the reason that you just blow people off is, is because you give them the impression you don't really matter. You, you have the mind over matter day. You, we don't mind and you don't matter. All right, now look, I'm giving you this marital counseling. Notice what he says in verse number 17. But whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother, that's important, have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? I'll show you. Look over at, uh, uh, let's see come to Exodus chapter number 7. You know how, that, how he has that? He's got a hard heart. In other words, you see his brother have a need, right? You notice in the past, he shut up of his bowels of compassion. Where would the bowels of compassion resolve, reside? Brother Russell got it. Where would the bowels of compassion, where's compassion come from? It comes from your heart. Now, doing what I did for so many years, it's pretty easy to get yourself into a position and you can say it's because of the job and so on and so forth. And that's true. In order to do certain things, you can learn to be rather cold and callous. You have to work at that. Amen. I remember when I first, uh, when, I, when I was still down there and trying to do the deal as far as the church is concerned and all that, I recognized something strange about me. It had been a long time since anything had touched my heart and uh, even made me get teared up or tearful. I mean, I understood about sin and, you know, ungodliness and all that other kind of stuff. But, it, you know, sometimes those stories and stuff would touch your heart and kind of snatch a tear out of your eye, you know, and trickle down your cheek and you'd kind of, you know, <laughs> you know, a little bit like that. I'm just cold as a stinking ice cube. And I began to pray about it. And I said, Lord, I don't know. And I'm, then, of course, my lost my daddy. And, and now a lot of things happened around that kind of a deal. But... I remember one of the main things was when I was down at a meeting down south of here and I remember the Lord dealing with me and I went to the altar and I'm down there talking to the Lord and the next thing I know there's a puddle of tears there on that mourner's bench. And the Lord said, I see you got your tears back. You know, until I lost my dad, honestly, death was clinical to me. I'd trained myself to do that. I saw so much of it. I'm not trying to be a hero now and all that, but I, I saw more than my share of it where I was back back then, and, uh, and a lot of it, and, and enough of it that it began to be, you know, like, okay, write a report and call the 
the uh, Hearst people over there to come get him or the coroner's office and call the big boys in homicide and do all this and that and the other and secure the scene and all that. I could do it in my sleep. And, and then it just got to be somebody died. It's like, okay, well, that's part of life. I see it almost every day. And the Lord's like, yeah, but a different one is personal. That's one of the greatest things that ever happened to me in the ministry. If you could go back and listen to me the way I preached up into that point and then watch what happened after that took place, you know what you'll see? You'll see a definite change. You say, why? The Lord used that to show me I lacked compassion. I, I'm, I'm ashamed to tell you that. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I mean, that's not fun for me to tell you that. I could get up and preach a sermon with some real tear jerkers in it, and I could, <laughs> I could preach it, but my voice didn't crack. I didn't get a sock in my throat. I go to my friends' funerals and stuff, and when Michael Dine, we are rolling him out here, man. I'm fighting that thing, man. I wanted to bell her like a calf just came out of mama, you know, and all that, and I'm biting my lip and trying to keep it under control because you're supposed to. I remember Jim telling me, uh, he said, you know, you do your crying in private, you don't do it in public. You know, you cry so that when you get ready to preach, you don't, you don't cry and all that stuff. And I'd learned that, but my goodness, man, I was cold as a cucumber. You're missing a big element. There's the Lord. I would have gathered you as a hen gathered his chicks, but he would not. He wept over Jerusalem. Compassion. He was moved with compassion among the multitudes because of their lack of things. And I'm thinking, boy, you got something missing. Amen. And of course, the fire breathers, you know, the, the killers, they love it. You know, the, 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 the SWAT team guys, the, you know, they, they like that stuff. It's just always hard and fast all the time, hop and pop, spraying. That's a, yeah, preacher, give it to us like that. <laughs> but boy, when it comes to taking care of somebody who's lost a child, You can't move through that stuff clinically. Not and be no preacher, you can't. Right. Not and be no. Not and be a preacher, you can't. You have to learn to have compassion. You know what you see? You have people all around you right now. And you can't see what I see. But I've learned about reading faces. You've got people all around you right now. Man, if you knew what was in their saddlebag. I mean, they're hurting. The great thing about it is twofold. Number one, they're still here. And they're still trying. But the second thing is, is as they work through that thing, the Lord will teach them things that will help them to be a minister later on. But <laughs> that's rougher than any seminary you've ever been in in your life. Amen. And you get to a point where God can use that to bend you, to mold you, and to make you, and not be so clinical in your delivery of things. God's finally got you soft enough He can really use you. But until then, you're just a stormtrooper. You say, why? Your heart's hard. It's not just hardening your heart, ladies and gentlemen, about the things that have to do with sin. This is what I try to caution you about. I don't see any little ones in here, but I'm going to give you another word of caution. We've got a, some teenagers here, but I, most of them are over there. It's what I caution you about all these video games and about these kids watching all these murder shows and all that stuff. Your mind is made in such a fashion that it is able to turn that off to protect you from the physical, logical responses to those things. And if you keep watching it, watching it, watching it, watching it, you turn off the natural response. And you just keep blowing people up and shooting people and cutting them in half. And then you drive by a wreck out there and all you want to do is see how bad somebody's hurt and you could care less. That's, a not, that's an unnatural response. And you keep letting your kids do that. You rewire their, all the brain synapses in there, especially when they're really young. Of course, it's hard for you to tell your kids not doing it when you're the one with them doing it. You say, all video games are bad. No, Mario's not bad. You can do okay with that. I don't have any idea what's how I watch them on the plane. I watch them going through security. I watch them all that. They got kids in strollers. Games. These little things, a young girl sitting next to me, she couldn't have been more than maybe 14, sitting by me yesterday and getting ready to go. And she starts doing this and that and the other. And mom just reached in and never even looked at her and just goes, hands her a phone. She puts in her earplugs and she plugs it up to something and she's 
right here like this, looking at it, watching it. Just like that. I happened to get on the plane first and I watched her get on the plane and she's just... There's nothing wrong with her mentally. She's just living in another world. It creates a fantasy. It affects your heart and how you perceive things. I know you think I'm just an old stick in the mud preacher. You know, just an old <laughs> preacher. You don't know what you're talking about. No, I do know enough about the devil to know he knows how to get you. He gets you with your eyes, doesn't he, boys? All right. Well, maybe the kids don't watch the stuff you do as an adult. Maybe they just watch the other and it's cartoon, so it's okay, right? You know, years ago they used to teach something and of course they did it for the purpose of trying to make sure people didn't graduate up as far as drug stuff and all was concerned. So they would say marijuana is a gateway drug. It stayed on the surface, didn't it? And people believed it was a gateway drug, didn't they? Well, where is it now? It's listed with a list of prescriptions that a doctor can give you for medical cures. And so you can get a card for it. And now all of a sudden you got people that are thinking being sick and well, if it's a gateway drug, what do you think is going to happen with your drug problem? When they created synthetic heroin a long time ago and they did a whole thing, got a whole bunch of people hopped up on that stuff, using it as painkillers and stuff like that. You know that it took them over 10 years to have that thing adjusted the, the right way because the pharmaceutical companies were so heavily embedded in it that they, never, they just completely ignored the facts of it. They said it's not the same thing. It's identical. It has the same pull. You say, well, oh, preacher, you're just being kind. Okay. The book's going to be true whether it's the me preaching it or some other donkey preaching it that's going to come out. You can't play around with it and it not get you. It used to be liquor and alcohol. Not anymore. Too easy. I talked to a friend of mine out in Colorado. They got a real problem. The, the, not the Surgeon General, but whoever the city medical guy is. He said, we have a real problem, uh, almost to the point of it being an epidemic for elementary and junior high school kids. They're coming to school and they're already high on their parents' gummy bears. Because they inject gummy bears with THC, with marijuana, and their kids are eating gummy bears. And they come to school and he said, now we're dealing with a bunch of kids that are stoned and they're in elementary school. Oh, preacher, you just make, okay. You can go down there now. The last time I was there, uh, last, no, year before last I was there. You know what they have? They have vending machines that are there. I'm not kidding you. Vending, not go to a place and put in your prescription. Vending machines. And you go in and you pump your money in that thing and pull the thing and here it is. No way to regulate that. Suppose I do have a card and he doesn't. All I do is buy it for it and hand it to him. Uh, with a little markup, of course. I mean, just, you know. You say, what is it? Oh, it's no big deal, man. I mean, the government regulates it now. You have to have it all organic and no pesticides and this and that and the other. And they come in and inspect your grow houses and stuff like that. And, and so they, they fix it up where you go at 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know who's complaining about it? The ones that did it and grew it in their backyard and now it's cut into their business. <laughs> the cartels are upset about it. So the cartels realize, hey, if you can't beat them, join them. So you know what they do? The cartels are financing the biggest drug, I mean, the biggest drug operations they have over there. They got giant grow houses. How many of you ever seen a chicken farm before? Anybody? You know how long those houses are, those chicken houses? They got grow houses over there that are big enough to fill a football field. You see, where do they get all that money? Can't whoop them, join them, man. Those boys own that stuff. Well, let me show you why. Isn't it, isn't it good to come to church and get, get caught up on the world? <laughs> Exodus chapter number 7. Look, if you will, please. Verse number 12. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents, and Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. This is the miracle that went on, right? Yes. Now, would you agree that's a pretty big miracle? Yes. Their rods become snakes. So Aaron says, okay, I got one for you. He throws his rod down, and that snake eats up all their snakes. That's a pretty big deal. I would be convinced by that. Yes. Probably a king snake there eating them up. I don't know. But the Bible says this in verse number 13. 
And he hardened Pharaoh's heart and hearkened not unto them. And the Lord said, had said, the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart's hardened, refuses to let the people go. You say, what happened? The Lord fixed it where Pharaoh couldn't even do it. His heart's hard. But the story doesn't stop there. That's not a one time or one thing fixes all. Look in chapter number nine. Well, what if the Lord hardens your heart? He may harden your heart, but it's not permanent. He still gives you a choice, doesn't he? Amen. Sure he does. It's free will. Exodus chapter number nine. Look in verse number seven. Pharaoh sent, and behold, there was not one of the cattle of the Israelites dead. And the heart of Pharaoh was what? Hardened. And he didn't let the people go. Who hardened it? I don't care what the Lord does. I don't care what. You ever seen that happen with a Christian before? Yes, you ever seen them on a regular basis, just continually time and time and time again. Look at uh, chapter 8. Look at verse number 19. Verse number 19. The magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice, and they could not, uh, could not. So there were lice upon man and upon beasts. Then the magician said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. So well, what happened to him? He got to a point where the Lord said, Okay, that's what you want to do. That's Romans 1. The Lord warns the people in Romans 1 and warns them and warns them and warns them. And then after that, because they didn't regard God as God and worship and serve the Creator more than the Creator. And then over a period of time, the Bible says, And God gave them up to a reprobate mind. Not God made them have a reprobate mind. God gave them over to that reprobate mind. Why? Because he looked down on their mind and their mind was such a cesspool. The Lord said, there's not anything in there worth fooling with. So just go ahead and go your way. That's the, what you choose. If that's what you choose, here you go. You say, well, when does that light finally go out? When you die. But that heart can get so messed up, ladies and gentlemen, you can't hear him when he talks to you. Uh, let me ask you this. This is a bit rhetorical. Come to 1 Samuel chapter 6. We've got a couple minutes here. 1 Samuel chapter 6. It may just be me and it may just be your kindness, but I feel like some of you, the lights are starting to come on a little bit and you're kind of starting to get it. It's like, yeah, you know what? That's kind of making sense to me now. 1 Samuel chapter number 6. I, you get this impression nowadays that uh, Christians, you know, it doesn't make any difference what, what happens. You know, you, the Lord's going to always be there. Well, that's true. The Lord doesn't shut the door, but you realize that your heart can get so full of sludge and so full of smut and so full of things it shouldn't have that you can't hear the Lord anymore. You ever have a Christian tell you something they know is wrong and say, well, I, don't, I ain't convicted by it. Well, what does that mean? Does it mean the Word of God's not true? The, the Bible said it's wrong, doesn't it? Well, don't bother me. The rainbow culture nowadays, you know what they say? I know what the Bible says. Don't bother me. Oh, well, hey, if it doesn't bother you, then that must trump what the Bible says, right? I mean, if it doesn't bother you, then doing according to different from what the Bible says, if it doesn't bother you, oh, well, then you're judge, jury, and executioner. Then, oh, it must be okay in that. Or could it be their heart is so messed up that they can't hear God when God says, hey, that's wrong. Listen, man, do you realize in all the time that Bundy sat down there, even after they caught him on death row and all that, do you realize the only thing, the closest you would come to ever seeing that guy give you any inkling of a confession was always in the third person? He would say things like this when he would talk. He'd say, well, now, I wouldn't do something that way, but if I was to do it, this is the way. I, and he'd literally go right down the line of exactly what he did. Now, I didn't do it, but, it, but if I was going to do it, and then run down through that. You say, what is that? It didn't bother him at all to kill people. Right. You say, what happened? Heart trouble. So, oh, he's psychotic and psychotic. He needs a psych psychiatrist and all that. Yeah, but you know something? A psychiatrist can't fix his heart. You know how many people he went to see and never fixed him? Right. John Wayne Gacy could listen to kids screaming and holler and keep them alive sometimes two and three days, chained to a board on a plastic sheet and torture them and do ungodly and unspeakable things to them until he finally killed them and dug them a hole in the basement and then poured concrete over it and went on living his life and became the leader of one of the Democratic parties down there and all that kind of stuff. And people thought he was one of the greatest guys in the world. His heart just as black as the ace of spades. Didn't bother him at all. No, no conscience. You say, well, there's just something wrong with their mind. You mean their heart. 
no emotion. Certain things ought to bother you. How come it is only anger gets you? Gets you? Where's the balance to the anger? Where's the balance to the bitterness? Is that the only emotions you can feel? Is just bad emotions? There are bad emotions. Let me give you one more here. We'll go the rest of this this evening here. But look, if you will, please, it's almost 1030. Look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter number 6. The Lord's going to make an illustration here. Uh, talking about the Bethshemites here that are coming along. The Philistines have been called out and the priests and the diviners and so on and so forth. I need you to come all the way down to, um, let's see here, verse 6. No, 5. Wherefore you make images of your emrods. There's a sermon in that. You say, well, preacher, when you say that stuff about, yeah, burn and itch until you give them special treatment, make images out of them. The reason they're acting the way they are is, is they want you to worship them instead of worship the Lord. Amen. Give me special attention. So you thought I was outside the Bible. No, I just thought you were being silly. No, I'm being honest. Amen. Like the Philistines. And images of your mice and the mar of the land, and you give glory unto God of Israel. Peradventure, he will lighten his hand from off you and from your gods and from off your land. Wherefore then do ye what? Harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts. What? I thought it was just Pharaoh. No, the Egyptians didn't want the children of Israel gone either. That's why that last thing comes through with the first kid getting killed in each one of them. And they come to Pharaoh and said, man, let these people go. But up until that point, you know what's happened with Pharaoh? He's doing the will of the people. He sent out a survey and he did a poll. And the poll said, ha, me let go of my slaves? Let go of my servants? Let go. Man, do you realize what will happen to my bottom line? you got to be kidding me. No, don't let them go. Crank down on them. I mean, we got to do something about this insurrection, this uprising around here. This is out of control. I mean, those people in here, don't they realize how good we're taking care of them and what we're doing? I mean, hey, crank down on them. Uh, the people hardened their hearts and Pharaoh hardened his heart. Uh, notice what you say. Uh, when he had wrought wonderfully among them, uh, did they not let the people go and they departed? And you say, what happened? Oh, they had a change of heart, didn't they? Yes. They went to Pharaoh and say, Pharaoh, the survey says, let those people go. <laughs> and Pharaoh said, okay, well, now I've got the popular vote. I'm gonna, not going to lose the next election because I'm going to be doing what the people want done because it's all about the people. Right? Father, bless your word this morning. Thank you, Lord, for such a good hearing. Thank you for these folks uh, listening and uh, paying attention. Appreciate it if you'd be with us in the upcoming service. Bless all the people that have a part in that. And uh, bless it. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.